Welcome back, everyone. Adam LaFacci, your moderator, rejoining you. And thanks for joining us for the final session of the Will to Adorn conference today, Pass the Mic. And I'm going to pass the mic right over to Sheree Hayes to kick us off. Hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be able to present for the conference this um, afternoon going into evening. Um, my name is Sheree Hayes, and I am a PhD student at Michigan State University in African American Studies. And my colleague and I, Courtney Green, who is an educator in the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, will be presenting our um, presentation past the mic today, and um, it's a group of amazing young researchers that Courtney had a chance to lead on the ground doing hip-hop style um, work and Afro-punk through the lens of our very own city that Courtney and I are actually from, Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and then that will be followed by a brief presentation that I'll do regarding um, exploring fashion through the lens of social justice work, in particular, the Trayvon Martin case. So without further ado, I definitely want to figuratively pass the mic to Courtney Green. Hello, how are you doing? I am Courtney Green, um, and like um, Trey said, I am a educator at Max Hayes High School here at the Cleveland School District in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I worked with a group of wonderful young students from um, the grade levels of ninth grade up to the 11th grade at Max Hayes High School, which is on the west of Cleveland. And um, it was just kind of seen out of their lenses, and they wanted to uh, research hip-hop culture and also this new age of Afro-punk that is coming up through the hip-hop culture. Um, on this first slide, you'll see that we have a picture of um, – Two artists on the left hand side, which is uh, Kia Cuddy, and um, we also have um, Chip the Ripper. They're both from Cleveland, Ohio, and born and raised, and they're both signed to uh, Kanye West record label. And um, we've uh, came across them a few different times um, in passing, and they're definitely what we would consider to be um, hip hop style. Um, new generation, uh, they are a part of that backpack um, hip-hop culture that came up about 10 years ago, and um, Kanye West would even consider himself that new age of uh, hip-hop culture that is coming through. And then you have on the right-hand side a picture of uh, two young ladies um, that are now, um, that's that Afro-punk that is coming through the hip-hop um, era. And as I go on throughout the slides, You'll notice um, I'll give you and I'll elaborate more about how the Afropunk is now starting to um, come into the um, hip hop culture. Um, next slide. This um, this kind of basically giving you a little overview about some of the students that I worked with. Um, none of them uh, has a background in um, in more so of researching and interviewing. These were all students that were um, hand selected by the principal and teachers that worked at Max Hayes for a few years now. This is my first year being there, so I really didn't know a lot of the students. So it, it, it gave me a time to kind of really um, meet them and understand them and um, uh, a, like have conversation with them and have an open dialect with the um, generation and see what they uh, are more comfortable with and how they feel about where hip hop is right now and how it's influencing them in their fashion. Um, so there were two young uh, young ladies out of the whole group, uh, one by the name of Jay, one by the name of uh, Monet, um, and they're, they're very just artistic in this field. One has pink, blonde hair, another one has red and black hair, and they're very just, they, they just kind of you know, march at their own beat, but they're uh, respectful about it, and they um, they don't hold any punches. They're very much what they would consider to be Afro-punk. And then we had um, the rest were young men, and they were, you know, very uh, forward-moving with their styles as well, and they were really interested and started um, researching um, as we went on and, and found different people throughout the time. Next slide. We um 
we wanted to uh, pick these two styles because um, hip hop being something that you know they they listen to every day and they see every day on TV and it's very so much a part of their culture and um and their everyday life. They um they wanted to research that, but in researching that, they they found that Afro punk is this new age and this new thing that a lot of people are um, taking on, and that actually came through the wavelengths of what what people maybe would call um, rock and roll, and it they combined in some ways, and now you see a lot of you see a lot of young people. Um, that are starting to get nose piercings where they didn't do that before, or they're um, starting to do um, they're starting to do tattoos on faces, and young women that are starting to do uh, tattoos on their chest where they didn't do that before as well. Coloring their hair pinks and blues and um, red. Um, as we go on, um, we'll elaborate more on on that and we actually uh talked to a tattoo parlor that gave us a little more information on that next slide. Um and this is uh basically just uh just a pocket of, you know, how uh Cleveland is kinda spread out in um the Cuyahoga County and we how we found the people in the and the communities of different styles that we found here in Cleveland. Slide. This um, uh, is a young man by the name of Vance uh, Taylor Monroe. Um, he actually is an artist, and he wanted to separate himself as an artist. Um, so he was given the challenge some years ago to uh, start painting people's tennis shoes. And he, that's kind of ironic. I, I don't want to do that. And he told the students that uh, if he didn't, um, if he had closed his uh, mind or shut his mind and didn't think so much out of the box, then he possibly um, wouldn't have did what you see here before you on this slide, which was a pair of tennis shoes that he did for the president, um, President Obama, some years ago, the first time that he was elected. And now those tennis shoes are actually, they will be placed in the White House Museum, and a pair of them are also placed in the Smithsonian. And he um, he talked about separating your style, and then also um, how on the slide also you see that it says um, fashion used to influence hip-hop, and now hip-hop is influencing fashion. And um, they what they discovered in doing that, actually listening to what artists are saying when they listen to the music that they're listening to and not necessarily just hearing it. They really listen and absorb the things that they were saying. So now you have um, different artists that are coming out with clothing lines and they're um, moving forward with that and not just being in the box of, you know, I'm going to take the mic and I'm going to sing, but they're definitely, like, influencing which fashion and what's going down the runway now in the hip hop community, and um, this young man just um, helped them see that more, and they they said they they really noticed that, and that was something that they really appreciated as well. Next slide. This right here is a um, a well known uh, tattoo parlor here in Cleveland, Ohio. And it is where um, LeBron James has literally gotten all of his tattoos. Um, Daniel um, Gibson, the Cavaliers uh, basketball player, um, a lot of Browns players, a lot of them will go to Jimmy and John Tattoo Parlor. They have about four different locations here in the city. And um, a lot of young people, when when they get first tattoos, they want to go there um, because they're very well known. They're very great artists, and they were able to sit down with them and some of their other artists in the tattoo parlor and just kind of have like a round table about, um, you know, how the the different art that they've had to do over the years, how long it takes to be a tattoo artist, and and um, 
they've noticed that they've had to do more piercings in the last year um, than tattoos than they used to do in the past. And they said that that's something that's very interesting because that's not something that they did most of um, before, but they are doing a lot more now piercings, like I said before. And um, a lot more women that are coming in that want to get art done on on their chest cage and just not necessarily like an arm tattoo. And that's not something before as well that women used to get. And now that's something that, you know, they're starting to do. Um, and the students really found that interesting and how now that is um, becoming a part of, you know, expressing themselves within hip hop and within Afropunk fashion here in Cleveland. Next slide. Um, these right here are the young men um, that I worked with, and they were they were always so willing and always um, ready to like learn whenever we had a person come in to talk to. And um, some of the things that uh, they have taken away from this, the young man on the left end with the locks, he said. Um, he thought that he was a little more open and that he was able to just kind of talk to anybody, but it kind of broke him out of his shell more so than he actually knew. And he also said that he um, he also learned that he loves to take pictures. He took a lot of the pictures, and he was the person that was behind the camera. And then um, the other young man with the bag on, he, um, Jordan, he says um, he didn't realize that he would have been you know, so willing to, like, interview. He thought he was going to actually be a little more shy than what he was. But he was um, he was always, like, coming up with questions and would, like, research the people before we went to go talk to them and find out, you know, what they had done so he would know what kind of questions to ask them. And the same thing with um, the Carlos on the side of him um, working down the line from um, the left to the right. Um, he, he too, um, would come up with questions, and um, he really found that he liked that and he was interested in that and um, would ask me and have it done before I even had to say anything or, or do anything. And um, the other man, um, young man, all the way to the uh, right of the picture, he, um, he took a lot of the pictures and he would, you know, find different things that are different people that he thought would be interesting that we would need to know or, or want to know more about. Um, one of the pictures that um, we weren't um, able to put in the slide, we were able to um, interview a, another young lady that was so gracious to invite us to her home where her studio is, and her name is Jay Joel. And she told us some information about how she grew up in Cleveland and her father was a tailor, and she makes um, she makes men clothing. and um, and that's how she was really influenced here in Cleveland and how a lot of young men and a lot of young women would dress up going to high school. So what the students have chosen to do is um, for a month long, they talk to the principal. They want to do a different um, style of dress for each week. So they want to go to the 20s and 30s. They want to go to the 40s and 50s. They want to go to the 60s and 70s and bring it up to the present day now and um, kind of give information on each of those points every time those years come up. Next slide. Then the um, last slide that we have here is just, you know, our beautiful skyline of Cleveland. And uh, we, uh, we are um, coming up, as you see, with all the information that we found and the research that the students have found um, here in Cleveland. Uh, and now I am going to pass the mic to uh, Sheree Hayes. Thanks, Courtney. Um, Courtney is just an amazing educator and someone who is such a jewel. Um, it, it takes a special person to not only rise from our Cleveland public school system as we both did, but also to come back and be an educator within that same system. And I think that's what makes this project and what Wilt to Adore and brought to Max Hayes such a unique thing. And also, Courtney is a part of the Cleveland fashion um, world. And one, one unique reason why you should keep an eye on Cleveland, just to add to Courtney's amazing presentation, is that 
the artists, the artisans that she mentioned are all um, started their artistry in their 20s and 30s or even back into high school. And so what we found is that a lot of our exemplars and communities of style and artisans of style all started as youth. And so that's really where the access began um, in Cleveland. Right. So <laughs> switching gears just a bit, um, just want to give everyone listening a very brief snapshot of how this amazing work of youth access through Wilson Dorn can be done through a social justice lens. And, um, and in particular, I developed a proposal for a site called My Brother's Keeper, which is a mentoring program um, based in Detroit and in Lansing with a partnership with Michigan State. And this project was called Through the Lens of Style, the Trayvon Martin Case and Representations of Black Manhood. And of course, this curriculum was inspired by the World to a Dorm. So what you see here on this next slide is an image of the iconic image now of Trayvon Martin donning a hoodie. And around Trayvon, you see some of the students from My Brother's Keeper. And they also are wearing their hoodies for a specific project that was a part of the curriculum last year. And I'll talk about that in more detail later. But I just wanted to show Trayvon framed by these young men in middle school also wearing their hoodies just to show that the, the hoodie, which is part of hip-hop style in a way that Courtney mentioned, is very much a part of the fabric of African-American culture and African-American fashion, youth African-American fashion. So uh, definitely a part of the fabric, pun intended. So again, My Brother's Keeper is a mentoring program operating now with a partnership between Paul Robeson and Malcolm X Academy Middle School in Detroit, Michigan and then Michigan State University. And it has an African-centered curriculum, but it also focuses on leadership development, critical literacy development, college access, as well as really truly centering the histories and cultures of African-American people. And you'll see some of these photos of the young men in their hoodies throughout. One undercurrent that really inspired this proposal is the timeline or the symbol of the hoodie within the case. I don't want to make this a surface discussion and just say that the Trayvon Martin case was a, was primarily about the hoodie. It was not. However, for some reason, the emphasis and the, the, the image of the hoodie and a black man donning a hoodie for, uh, for whatever reason really captured an audience. And so our young men really took that and ran with that and, um, did other projects, and this school to adorn curriculum can possibly take those other projects to the next level. So some of the curriculum goals that are in place for how this type of work might look in My Brother's Keeper or other programs that you might be running yourself. Um, curriculum goals include the students working together to identify, document, and present, and that's definitely a nod to mind builders and the curriculum that Ms. J. Banks developed for this type of work and the Smithsonian's will to join, of course. And so those students would identify these communities of style and artifacts of style in relationship to this, this type of hoodie in association with black manhood, but also black manhood at large and images that they see and, and face and develop every day. And then through this process, they um, enhance and existing and develop new research skills. So with that, other peer curriculum goals included uncovering in instances of bias and examples that they may face or that those that they interview may face, developing, of course, a culminating and interactive public presentation to present this information back to the communities that they were researching. And also, more importantly, and just as uh, the group studying hip hop style and Afro punk in Cleveland is doing, and our our partnership between Courtney and I, really understanding their roles as researchers and skilled and talented global citizens making a mark through their work. And I think that's what's the beauty of all of the presentations and all of the work that you've seen today. Students really taking ownership of of their role in creating a growing archive and changing how people view black style and adornment. 
the past projects that I mentioned, as those little hoodies and the images that you're seeing throughout of the students, included an April 2012 hoodie photo shoot where the students did their own, took their own photographs and did their own editing, editing and created a video and photo montage. And this was all done within the span of an MBK day. An MBK day is just really eight hours on campus, the students come from Detroit and come to Michigan State. And so they did all of that work and were very inspired inspired by the topic, but also the medium and the various forms of media that they can present this through. And then January um, 2013, we had a visiting artist at Michigan State University that had a chance to shoot our young men on green screen, green screen in their photos. Um, in their hoodies, I should say, excuse me, and then recreate those photos. And so you see the green screen photo here and then how those images were turned into another art form. And Ito Otatigbe is the artist's name, he's an international artist, and he used those to add to a growing exhibit that he's taken with him all over the world, which is really exciting. The framework for how this curriculum could look in the fall 2013 sense, but now that will actually be transitioned into a later date. Uh, as you see before you, week one, discussing this, this image of black manhood and these images of black manhood as a form of critical literacy. Week two, locating, having our students locate a particular stance within this framework. And week three, personalizing their own stance, agreeing or disagreeing with the information that they gain from the communities, from the research, from these artisans, communities of style, and exemplars of style that they were interviewing, and we for being open to what they're learning. So whether or not they were shaped or reshifted what they were thinking previously about this topic based upon what they learned from the community. And last but not least, a willingness to engage and re-articulate what they learn as a result. You can't really read this, but it's more so for the purposes of just seeing. If you are interested in doing this type of fashion through social justice lens type of work, the team that developed this proposal along with myself, we did a good deal of concept mapping, and it was just really helpful to identify those five weeks that we would infuse and implement this curriculum into MBK. So just think about it. It's really helpful work. So that's pretty much it for Courtney and I. It's been such a pleasure doing this work. We, Courtney and I are really proud Clevelanders, but we're also very proud to be students and um, teachers and community workers and activists and volunteers in the Midwest. And we consider the Midwest where it's best. No hate to any other areas, but definitely uh, proud of where we're from. <laughs> Wonderful. We'll, we'll forgive you here on the East Coast for that. Um, really <laughs> excellent, excellent programs. And uh, what uh, beautiful and, and haunting photos. Uh, that was a, a fantastic project to highlight. Um, we also have a few questions that are coming in from our participants. So I'd love to field some of those to you before we wrap up today. Um, I, I see Diana early on had asked, what distinguishes the music of Afropunk? Courtney, you want to take that or you want me to I can jump in. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. You said what distinguishes... Uh, what distinguishes the music of Afropunk? Well, um, there's different... Um, what we have... We have some artists, like the artists that... Are you asking the artists that are involved in it or... I think we're going to. I guess it's just... Hello. I think it's just like the distinguishing factors of what makes out of uh, Afro Okay. Yeah. It's more so. Um. Just it used to be more of a punk rock, what people would consider rock and roll, quote unquote, um, type of style, which was the um, different colors of hair. That's not something that you would normally have seen in the past um, with hip-hop, and even talking to the, um, the tennis shoe artist, 
um, he was saying that you had um, people that were like Will Smith and people that were like Run DMC uh, that it was just like a strict thing of like just a tennis shoe um, and your clothes that match the tennis shoe. But now you have a lot of the students that are taking on this thing where they're um, bitch matching with print and they're, they're being very colorful and bright and that wasn't something that you've seen before and that is like infusing into um, hip hop now. Right. It's like a hybrid for sure. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I see Anastasia in Milwaukee is asking, is the MBK curriculum developed through Michigan State African American Studies Department or uh, is it developed another way? The MBK program and standing curriculum is a program of the African American African Studies program or department of Michigan State University. Yes, it is an associated community program that is housed in our African American Studies program. Um, the curriculum or the proposal that we that we discussed today was something that a team of mentors that are involved in that program develop in conjunction with schools who are doing. <laughs> Great, thank you. And I see a clarification here from Diana wondering specifically what are some of the musical artists um, connected to uh, uh, to Afropunk as we were discussing earlier? Um, Nicki Minaj is something that the students gave a um, a um, example of. Rayana would be an example of uh, one. Uh, even Chris Brown, um, although he's more so like a um, a like a singing artist, but those are all what they would consider to be a um, more on the um, taking on. They're still very much hip hop, but they're taking on that new um, Afro punk. Um, way. And I think to add to what Courtney mentioned is, um, is definitely important to think about um, how Afropunk is defined differently in different regions. You know, for our students in Cleveland, um, they, they're they self-defining what they consider to be Afropunk and the artists that fall within that category. But you might get a different answer from Brooklyn, which has a really strong definitely. and leading Afropunk culture as well. So. And what, I, and, and what I would would like to say also with that, um, in talking to the different um, different people that we interviewed, um, Cleveland, it it was and it and it still kind of is, um, uh, which somebody might consider to be like a conservative place. Um, so with like tattoos, although we do have a lot of people who have tattoos, even myself being a person that does. Um, you, um, that's not something that is, like, if you go more to the, to the East Coast or even out in, um, L.A., people, a lot of people have them, and it's, it's, it's more so, I, I guess, would be the norm there, but here, a lot of people, it's not, that's not, I won't say look down upon, but a lot of people, that's not a norm thing for people to have, so that is, it's a new wave of being in, in the last, mm -hmm. like, five years now a lot of people coloring their hair bright colors and and doing those type of things and it's and it's because of what they see on tv and because of the magazines that they read and um before in talking to um miss jerrell um and the different people that we talked to they were from different generations miss jerrell grew up here in cleveland when it was the um 1930s uh, and 40s um, here in Cleveland, Ohio, and she said a lot of people would, you know, the boys would literally dress up. They would really dress up to go to school, and the, and the, and the young ladies would. They would dress up to go to school, like they were going to church or going to a, a nice event, she said, every day, just because they took pride in the way that they looked, and they, they um, made sure that they did that. And then also, um, the other young man that we talked to, he was like in his 30s, and he grew up here in Cleveland, in the east side of Cleveland, and he said that, you know, a lot of people um, then, uh, that's when, you know, Will Smith was big and Run DMC was big, so a lot of people wanted to wear their tennis shoes and they wanted to, you know, put on Adidas and um, then change up their colors to, like, distinguish themselves and customize their shoes and stuff. So that, those are um, 
things in ways that um that they just kind of it kind of changes over time, just like with anything, especially with fashion, it changes all the time. It's constantly changing. So that is um that's how it's like it's so, but it's still so fresh and new here in Cleveland. That style of fashion. That's great. Thank you. Um, I, I see that we're just starting to near the end of our time for this session today. So I, I do think we'll start to wrap up, but I, I do encourage you to share any other remaining thoughts you have in the chat box. I see a couple of questions are still popping in. So maybe if you could take a quick moment to uh, share your thoughts with our participants there, that would be much appreciated. And uh, I would like to just say a big thank you to both of you. This was such a wonderful note to end today's conference on. And uh, as we transition uh, out from this uh, this last session of the conference, I'm going to turn the floor back over to Sally and Diana to talk with us a little bit more about um, the kind of final notes and maybe some final takeaways from today. But uh, once again, a big thank you to you, Sheree and Courtney. A really wonderful way to end today. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Sheree and Courtney. You. Yeah, this has been absolutely incredible, and I think that um, from all of the aspects, it's it's, it's actually uh, not only lived up to our expectations of the great projects, but actually surpassed them. Um, and and uh, there's so many great kinds of exchanges that have taken place um, through the conference. So thank you, Ashley, Courtney, um, all of the all of the participants. Uh, both those who presented and those who listened in and, and gave great content. And I would just like to remind folks that um, if you're in case you joined us late that that um, what we saw today was uh, a variety of presentations from a few of the nine different youth access partner sites for the Will to Adorn Youth Access Program, which is just one part of a much larger research and documentation project called the Will to Adorn, which is headed up by our principal principal investigator and curator, Diana, Dr. Diana Baird and Jai. And um, we do encourage you to take a look at um, our Smithsonian um, Festival website. I'll drop that link in the um, in the thing and there's in the chat box. There's also a Pinterest site that has a lot of resources if you're interested in the Will to Adorn program. And we have developed a draft education program, a draft education curriculum that if you're interested in receiving that um, drop me an email at um, I'll drop my email address in the check box as well and you can receive a draft copy of that as well and we have um, a Facebook site so please you know tell all your friends to join um, we also uh, we have to thank um, the assistant secretary for uh, educational and public assets we've been funded for another year and next year, uh, the Will to Dorn Youth Access Project will uh, really focus on design thinking and presentations. And, and so um, we will be, we have another year of incredible programs. So um, uh, we are looking forward to being in contact with you uh, following this. And I want to make, say a special thank you to Learning Times, to the, um, uh, SCEDA, the Smithsonian Center for Education and Digital Access, and um, to all of the folks who have been involved in, in this program. And thanks especially to you in the audience who've hung in for the last few minutes here of the of the session. We really appreciate your participation. And thanks again to Adam and to Ashley for your excellent leadership of our session yes, today. Ashley. Yes, thank you. Wonderful. Well, you'll all notice that I brought up the Pinterest link there on the page again, so we do hope that you'll check out some of those additional resources. And uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us today. Take care, and we hope you'll check out the recordings and share them with your colleagues and friends as we get them posted over the next day. Thank you, everyone.